for some word today? Yeah. Trust you, trust you come ready. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Numbers. Book of Numbers. Does God believe in Numbers? Yes. <laughs> well, there is a book. There is that. Numbers chapter 14. I want to start with a few questions to get you thinking about what we're doing here today. Uh, why do some people succeed where others fail? Why do some continue while others fade away? Why do some serve God faithfully from the time of their salvation while others are inconsistent? Those good questions? Yeah. All right, we should all be looking at our own lives and Already some of you could be, you know, jumping in on one of these and say, well, that one was me. <laughs> that one should have been me, <laughs> but that one was me. Yeah, but I want to I analyze this. There are some things about us as individuals that can affect where we end up, can affect the results that we experience in life and what kind of person we will become. Numbers chapter 14, I'm just going to dial into this one verse here today and hopefully hit the context later. Some of you already know the context, but Numbers 14, 24, it reads, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Inherit it. All right. Uh, I want to explore this different spirit that characterized Caleb. Okay, different means there must have been others, and there were. In fact, it was the majority that had, and it had a spirit about them that was contrary to the way that Caleb was. But Caleb, having this different spirit, enabled him to follow the Lord fully. So his spirit had a built-in, you know, completion and full devotion to his walk with the Lord, while the spirit that was on, that was on the others, uh, they didn't follow the Lord fully. Otherwise, I wouldn't say this about him. Okay? Now, how many know we don't want to be different just to be different? We're not trying to stand out, draw attention to ourselves just because I don't want anyone to miss me or to ignore me. You know, sometimes being different could have a, a wrong motive. You understand what I'm talking about? You know, 100 pe there's 100 people and they all kind of look at generally a same the same way, but you look way out of the box different from them just because you want to wear, do something that's shocking, that gets attention, everyone pays attention to you. I don't know, kind of wonder, and that might be a pride issue, right? <laughs> so I, I don't want to be different just to be different. I'm not trying to just say everyone's like this and I don't like the way you are, so I want to be, I want to be a different way. But if the crowd is going the wrong way. I do want to swim against the, you know, the current. If the crowd is of the wrong spirit, so to speak, I want to go the other direction. And that isn't always the easiest thing. There are many temptations to blend, to just follow the crowd, just to be like everyone else. And there are times when we need to be different, and especially the more society is ungodly, we have to stick out. Yeah. We're supposed to stick out from an ungodly world, right? It, it, light stands out, is different when it's surrounded by darkness, okay? Where is that flashlight? You might have to search for it, unless it's on and the lights are off, and it's dark, then it's easy to find the flashlight, right? And so, and so we want to uh, be different when it comes to the ungodliness that is around us. And in Caleb's situation, he was surrounded by people who had a different uh, attitude. And, and some people follow the Lord partially, but this attitude keeps them from acting in such a way um, that God would consider full devotion. 
all right? Let, let me pose some more questions to you then. Thinking about God's best, God's will, His plan and purpose for our lives, His assignments, where He wants us to be. Now, the questions are, what can knock you out of God's will? What potentially could happen that would knock you out of God's will? What could people do to you? What could someone say? What could someone do uh, that would cause you, you know, to give up, to throw in the towel? All right? W what threat could, would make you back off of what God instructed, what God told you to do? Could anything happen? Is there anything out there that you would say, yeah, if this happens, I'm out? And... Man, that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. I think we should analyze, where are we in this? Caleb was facing much opposition from others, from the attitude, the position that others around him held, and he chose to buck it, to buck the system, to go against the flow, to do what the average person wasn't willing to do, and because of that, he was rewarded with an entrance into God's best for his life. But I want to pose some, some possibilities if someone said, well, nothing, no one could do anything, nothing could happen because I am fully devoted, I, I, have the, I have faith in God, no one could knock me out. Well, consider these and see if any of them ever have applied or, might, or do apply or might apply in the future. Let me give you a list of things to think about. Number one, a lack of money. A lack of money. Could a lack of money move you out of God's will? It has many people. This is, this is actually a very common thing whenever someone has a big vision. Whenever someone wants to achieve something great, and sometimes great includes expensive, <laughs> and, and, and there's a lot involved, then sometimes the lack thereof, I mean, I've heard people say, God told me to do this. Why haven't you done it? I don't have the money. And it's like, well, have you given up on it because you don't have the money? I mean, how many big things that have happened in life, in the world, have uh, started with a lack? Right. Meaning the vision was there, but the ability to carry that out wasn't there. But they pursued it anyway, and eventually everything was funded, everything was supplied. So sometimes, uh, lack of money, I'm struggling financially, and therefore... Therefore, I'm no longer doing what I'm supposed to do. There, I had this passion. I had this calling. I had this desire in me. But I don't have enough money, so I'm not going to. Here's another one. How about this? Criticism from others. Criticism from others. Have you ever been criticized? I mean, no, so has everyone else who's ever done anything important in life. Everyone who's ever put themselves out there to do something important, to do something of value, to do something uh, that was worth their effort and worth their time, they have been criticized by someone. But if criticism is the thing that keeps you and me away from God's best or from fulfilling God's will, then how many know the enemy knows what he needs to stir up? And there's... Unfortunately, there's usually a lot of vessels. You know how God's looking for people? <laughs> Calling people to do His will. The enemy's also looking for people. Unfortunately, there's a lot of willing people. Hey, can I borrow your mouth? <laughs> Amen. Let's not be used of the devil. Don't lend your voice of criticism to someone else. Because how many know it's not the Spirit of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So criticism from others. How about this one? Uh, number three, no appreciation. No appreciation. Would you stay on path? Would you stay on track? Would you stay in the right place? Do what God wants you to do unless people don't appreciate you. How many know, again, it's got quiet on that one. Say, <laughs> say, yeah, I feel that sometimes. Well, listen, so has everybody else who's ever done anything right anything noble, anything worthy. They have either felt it or they thought it, they perceived it, either it was true or they perceived it was true, one of, one of them, but they weren't appreciated for all the things that they did. They did things when no one else knew and no one else gave them a pat on the back or even an acknowledgement. Is that enough to keep you out of God's will? 
the absence of someone saying, attaboy. Someone saying, good job, I really appreciate that. How about this one, number four, disagreement. Disagreement, could disagreement with others keep you out of God's best, out of your place, out of doing the will of God for your life? Meaning, you disagree with others around you. You disagree with someone in, in authority. You disagree with someone in your home. You disagree with, the, with, with those who are involved in your, in your work or whatever you're doing. Disagreement. Well, I just can't be a part of this because I just don't agree with this. Okay, then that's the issue that keeps you out of God's best. How many know if you can't do something until everyone around you agrees with you? You're going to have a tough life. Right? Because the more, I mean, if you, if you have found someone to marry, people to work with, a church to attend, and, and everything else, and, and it, where everyone agrees with you, wow. <laughs> Maybe they're all brain dead. I don't know. <laughs> but that's a miracle. We have perfect agreement. No. How I many, a, a lot of times when we talk about disagreement, uh, our answer should be so what? It depends on what it is, I understand that, but a lot of disagreement is not a big deal. We're all, we all have fam families and friends and people that we don't agree with and we still like them. Can you get along with someone you don't agree with? Yeah, I know there's obviously levels. If you like are full on into murder, <laughs> I really disagree with you on a level that probably keeps us from being friends, okay? All right. But if you disagree with me on a lot of other issues, I think, let's hang out. We can still be friends. We can still see these things different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, even when it comes to church, yeah, I mean, if you tell me Jesus isn't the way or his blood didn't, wasn't shed for my sins, I'm not going to that church, you know. But there's some other things I could say, yeah, I see that different, but still love you and we can worship God together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, when it comes to a lot of disagreements, say, who cares? So what? No big deal. We, we, get, we get along. When it comes to uh, disagreeing with peers, when it comes to disagreeing, disagreeing with those who are over you, how many know that's where we, we, we find the word submission in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. How many know a lot of times when people have their first opportunity to submit, they say, well, I just can't agree with that. And they never submit. And they, 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 they flunk that test to their spiritual advancement by not being able to yield to someone else's way of doing things. Hallelujah. Here, so would disagreement knock you out? How about this one? Uh, the threat of failure. The threat of failure, meaning there's a possibility if I do this, if I, if I take this leap of faith, that I could fall on my face. There's a possibility I could put myself out there and not succeed. Okay, is that the thing that keeps you from stepping out, from acting, from doing God's will, from taking on the challenges that face you? Because again, is there a possibility of failure? In a human perspective, absolutely. But if we're going to be governed by that, I'll never do something. If there's not a 100% you know, guarantee that I'll be successful, then I'm going to live in fear yeah. of failure. And I'm going to sit back and never step out and never accomplish anything good for the Lord. That's right. Good work. Hallelujah. Here's another one. It's called hard work. <laughs> hard work. This sometimes keeps people out of God's best. Well, I don't want to do that. That looks hard. <laughs> That's going to take work. I'm going to have to get up in the morning. I'm going to have to work hard. I'm going to have to put myself out there. And, and how many know hard work? is not anti-grace. You can still receive a gift of God called salvation. You didn't earn it or work for it. You receive salvation by grace and other gifts of God by grace. But God still is, believes in work. Yep. Yeah? And, 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 and hard work, if, if, if something is hard and therefore I won't do it, or it's gonna, I'm going to have to work at this and I, I won't do it, then that's the thing that keeps me out of God's best. Be willing to sweat. Be willing to work hard. Well, I was going to take this job, but I went in there for the interview and I, you know, I looked at it and it's going to be hard work. <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? I know times have changed and generations have changed. Yeah. You go back a few generations and 
hard work was like very normal yeah. and frequently participated in by, by the masses. And in today's society, well, I don't want to do that. That looks hard. You know, there's no jobs around here unless you want to work 40 hours a week. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to hard work, I mean, oh, many people, uh, all, many of us, I'll just put myself in it, we don't like it in the present. It's because, man, that looks hard. I don't want to exert myself. That looks difficult. But when you look at it in the rearview mirror, you're glad you did it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that was hard work, and I've struggled with it at the time, but, man, that was worth it. Hard work is worth it. I, I grew up, as I've told many of you, uh, in the dairy business, and I tell you, a lot of it, growing up as, as a teenager, I despised it because I was always up before school feeding calves. I'm up in the winter, and I hate the winter. I know that hate is a strong word. I, I despise it. <laughs> Especially growing up working in it where your hands are numb in gloves. And you're trying to grab a knife and, you know... Anyway, all this stuff that we were... We, anyway, I grew up working before school, after school, on Saturdays. I, I get out, get off for lunch. You know, I'd go in to see friends on Saturdays. I'd go, a certain friend, I'd go knock on his door and no, no one would answer. I'd go in and he'd be in bed. <laughs> and I'd be like, I've never slept in in my life. <laughs> I didn't have any days where we slept in. There's just zero. Here's my point, though. In the moment, I didn't really like it. I thought, ah, it's hard. But looking back, I'm not worse off because I did that. I'm better off. All right. It, uh, it, hard work is, 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 a, is a good thing. I know several years ago, uh, someone was mowing our lawn because obviously we left the dairy business a long time ago. Uh, well, I left it before there was we uh, <laughs> to do ministry. And, uh, but someone in the church was mowing our lawn uh, for a while, I don't remember how long, but for free, they had a business. And they just came and started doing it. And I was like, praise God, thank you, Lord. That was a real blessing. Yeah. They'd come and mow. And then they, they changed their business. They weren't doing that anymore, so I lost my free lawn mowing. <laughs> and I used to do it, and then I, ha I got to stop. And when I stopped, I was glad. And when it was the free lawn mowing stopped, I was not glad. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? i got to mow the lawn again. Ah. I adapted my life to no lawn mowing. But I have a son. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, well, I could either pay someone to mow my lawn or I could buy a lawn mower and he could do it for free. And I did that. And you think, why did you do that? I didn't do it just for my own benefit because I didn't want to, I didn't want to mow it. I did it because I wanted, in part, I wanted to give my son a, a job without pay. <laughs> For his sake, is what I mean. I really mean that. Because I, I grew up working all the time. I'm thinking, uh, I didn't always like it, but I'm glad I did. And now I've got kids and they don't have, I can't do it to them. I don't, what am I going to make them do? And I didn't have any labor for them to do other than, you know, minor things around the house. So, anyway, don't run away from things because they're hard. Don't quit because it's hard work. Hard work can be very valuable. And then number seven, number seven is challenging circumstances. Would a challenging circumstance keep you out of God's best? Here's what I'm talking about here. Romans 8, uh, remember says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, not those who are led by circumstances. Well, I was going to do this, but circumstances didn't work out. Circumstances, and I can't anymore, or I'm no longer going to do that because of how things turned out. No, be led by the Spirit of God, not because things are not going right. Not because things are hard, not because of, of challenges or opposition or any of these things. No, led by the Spirit of God. When I have direction from the Lord, from His Word, and from His Spirit, then I'm going to plow through and push through any kind of circumstance, favorable or unfavorable. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we read Numbers 14, 24 from the New King James, remember, which said that Caleb had a different spirit now look at this from the, the New Living Translation. New Living Translation. It said, but my servant 
Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored and his descendants uh, will possess their full share of that land. So Caleb had a different attitude than the others. Because of that, he remained loyal and God brings him into the land. So, so consider that, that, that progression there. Why does God do certain things for some but not others? Can you see in this verse that that's true? All right, and you, if you read the story around the verses that we're reading today, you'll see that that's true. Why do some go into the land of blessing while others die in the wilderness? And you can see here the reason is because of a different attitude. Because of this different spirit, God will bring him into the promised land. In other words, the rest of you, with your stinking, unbelieving attitude, you can stay in the wilderness. Okay, I re just read between the lines there. That's what it's saying. <laughs> Caleb, because you have a different spirit and you are completely loyal to me, call, go on in. On. And your kids, your descendants, they're going to they're gonna have full possession of this. But the rest of you turkeys, you can, you can eat crow. I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that what they were eating for a while? Ravens. 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 <laughs> but you can stay out here. And they did. And that whole generation stayed out of God's best, out of God's will, out of God's promised blessings. They all did that because they wouldn't have this kind of spirit that Caleb had. Is that principle still true today? I'm telling you it is. That we have the option to model certain people and not others. And here we're given an example. And we can be like Caleb and enter in. I have some friends, one of my friends from way back, he lives in another state where uh, we're not in constant c contact, but, uh, you know, it's one of those friends that will always be your friend. And, uh, and he messaged me a while, a while back about his wife. He said she has cancer. And that was a, that's a terrible thing. And uh, he's a believer. She's a believer. They're saved. They love the Lord. They're committed to God. How many know commitment to God is not synonymous with faith in God's word? How many know you can't believe beyond your revelation? I have to have knowledge of God, his ways, and his will before I can have faith for him to perform those things in my life. So let's never confuse. This person, you know, sometimes they'll say when someone maybe passes away, they had, a, they had strong faith in God. What they usually mean is they had deep devotion to God. And I'm just saying it's not always the same thing. And in my friend's case, uh, definitely committed to the Lord. And so he shared this with me and said, would you, you know, um, would you pray for us? And, and I'm like, absolutely. My next re response to him was, uh, what scriptures? What promises are you guys standing on? What promises can I pray with you? What scriptures are you using to pray against this demonic thing that's in your, your wife's body? You know, I was met with was silence. Literally, he never responded. He's my friend. I'm like, ah, and I, I know him. He knows me. I know what's going on there. He doesn't think like that. He's a believer. But he hasn't been taught these things. In fact, he's been taught opposite. And then in updates, he would send out to me and to others, you know, it was a lot of the God is in control type of language. And uh, if you're not sure about that, I have some other teaching like uh, the series I did a while back called In Control. You should listen to that a few hundred times. Yeah, come on. Until you get that stuff out of you. But, you know, he, he, I, just, I was just met with silence, and I thought, ah, mm, I want to help. I want to pray. I want to believe with you. And after, uh, in another conversation, I, I said to him, I, I said, uh, can I offer you? If you're, I said, you know, we're friends. I'm here for you no matter what. Can I offer you a different perspective on healing? You know, I was, you know what I got back? Nothing. He went silent again. It's like, there's nothing to say about that. In other words, in other words, no. I'm t here's what I'm saying. That is one example of a different spirit. It's, it's, it's a different way of dealing with a horrible situation. He has one way. This is a different way. That way that he is entrapped in, in is, is very common. 
It's often the way the crowd goes. And how many know when you go the way of the crowd, you get praised? People, people they don't shun you. You're, you're like me. We like to be around people that are like us, don't we? Yes, but what if we're all going the wrong way? Ask Noah and his friends. You know, a lot of times the crowd's going the wrong way in Caleb's situation. He was bucking against the system there. And God said, and you are going to go in. And you are going to get all I've, I've promised you. You're going to enter into my best. They're going to die. It wasn't because God didn't give it all to them. They just wouldn't think like that. Amen. We should beware of the others. <laughs> that, what, what do I mean? Their attitudes. The, the negative attitudes of the un of the unbelieving crowd because they can't affect us. You remember recently we studied Romans 12, 2, which says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have an opportunity to conform to the world or be transformed by thinking different, renewing of the mind, thinking in, in, in a different way. All right, and it takes intentional effort to do this. In fact, it's so pervasive around us, we have to t intentionally get the Word of God implanted into our souls. We have to go after it and we have to take it and, and think about it and say it and meditate on it and put it in there to alter our thinking so that we can be different. Otherwise, we'll just go the route we've always gone. James 1.21 says, uh, Therefore lay aside filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, the, the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. In other words, God's implanted word, which takes meekness or humility to receive. Okay? Pride will say, ah, that's not the way I think. That's not the way I was taught. That's not the way I've always believed it. Humility says, let me take a listen. Let me hear what this has to say. Let me see if this is scriptural. Let me see if this is actually in the Bible. Let me see if this is real. I'm going, to give, I'm going to open my heart to it. What do you have to say? You know, I'm in a dire situation. You know, cancer situation or some kind of life-threatening thing. It's, if anything, let that open up your ears. And say, okay, I'm open. <laughs> Lord, teach me. How am I supposed to think about this? What am I supposed to do about this? And, and the openness, when the implanted word gets in us, it saves our soul. What's that? That's our thinking. It's, it saves the way we process this so we can move from a position of unbelief into faith, from a position of complaining and woe is me and why is the world against me to I'm an overcomer in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, and I can begin to declare victory instead of defeat. And it really makes a difference in who stays in the wilderness and who goes into the promised land. Amen. Everybody say it out loud. Say God's word, God's word. will fix my messed up mind. Messed up mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But think about the crowd again. Think about the crowd. Where, where, where the default is to go a certain direction. How many know that a lot of people have gotten off track with God due to the borrowed offenses of others? That means, that means someone else was offended, was hurt, was angry. Something was going on in them. It wasn't you, but it was them. But you got too close to them. And through the conversation and, and that spirit that was on them eventually got on you and now you're off track. Why are you doing this? Why? I don't know. I'm just angry. Oh, I'm just hurt. What happened? They don't even know. They think because so. <laughs> nothing did happen. But they got too close to those who were thinking that way. It, it, it's, it's like watching, watching uh, the news, listening to the news. Uh, you have to do it in measure. You have to take it in, 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 in measure. You can't, you can't do the three-hour-a-day radio program. You can't do all night, you know, watching the news and everyone saying the same thing again and again and again. Why? Because a lot of it, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it's all wrong. Some of it's right. But I'm saying some of it is you get angry. You, t you get angry because, you know, you look at the political system and, our, you know, and the ungodly that lead our country. You can get really angry. And if it's righteous anger and it's going to lead you to pray, good for you, you know, and, and to do things. But when, when you can't sleep at night because of it, ah, those idiots. Come on. And you take on that spirit, 
what's happening is you're borrowing someone else's problem. In other words, we got to maintain peace and joy. We got to maintain a spirit of faith inside of us, even in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Amen. Now we're reading Numbers 14 and verse 24. Listen to it again. This is the easy English Bible. But my servant Caleb has thought differently and he has obeyed me completely. So I will bring him into the land that he explored. It will belong to his descendants. Notice, notice the language here. He thought differently. It takes different thinking than the average person if one is going to obey God completely. A lot of people obey God partially, but to obey God completely, you have to think differently. Many have attitudes that actually prohibit God's perfect will from coming to pass in their life. I know we don't want to hear that. Say, I don't understand why it's not working. It's your stinking attitude. Yep. <laughs> we don't want to hear that, but I'm saying these things are, are connected to our believing. It's attitudes of faith, and we can respond differently to, what, to what's happening, and, and we've got to think differently. So in what way do you do this? Okay, question for you. Process your own life. How do you think differently today than you used to? Because all of us have a used to. All of us have a time we can look back and say, yeah, I kind of made a mess of some things in my life or I made some wrong decisions. I really thought about life and God and people and myself and I thought about everything in a certain way and now my, hopefully many of us can say, now my thinking is different. But in what way do you think differently now than the way you used to think? Okay, in what way do you think differently from the masses? How, how, how are you different from the crowd? Hallelujah. What am I talking about? In relationship to money, in relationship to some of those things we, we mentioned, lack and criticism and disagreement. How did you used to deal with disagreement and how do you deal with it now? How, 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 did, you, how did you used to deal with uh, criticism or a lack of, of appreciation and how do you deal with it now? Here, here's, the, here's the concern is that the same way we were doing it 10 years ago, we're still, still doing it that way. And we somehow disconnected God's word from our life. And we, you know, compartmentalize and we come to church and yay, I'm in my little yay box. <laughs> happy, happy, happy. I believe God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then we leave and get out of that box and go into our woe is me. And I'm mad at the world, and I'm angry at this, and this is frustrating. Why don't people appreciate me? And all this kind of stuff lives over here. And we got to intersect these things to where what we hear, what we know about God is true, and we apply it to real life. Because if our real life isn't changing, we're, doing, we're playing dead religion here. Hallelujah. What's our verse? Numbers 14, 24. Let me read that to you again from the, from the Living Bible. <laughs> but my servant Caleb is a different kind of man. He has obeyed me fully. I will bring him into the land. Uh, he entered as a spy and his descendants shall have their full share of it. So it's a different spirit. It's a different attitude than the others. It's a, it's a different way of thinking. It's a different kind of man. Caleb was a different kind. And I say, why don't you and I be a different kind too? Amen. Different than we used to be. Different than others who don't know God or don't have any interest in his ways. Different than where the, 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 the average person is going. We stand out. Not because we're trying to draw attention to ourselves, just because we have determined to pursue God's will and his ways and to believe his promises in spite of opposition and circumstances that yell at us and say it's not true. We say like Paul did on the ship uh, and when he was on the uh, prisoner on the ship, he said, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Amen. And there is a way to deal with life and opposition with a different way of thinking. And this is where we want to go. 
There is the status quo. Then there's you. Yay. We don't have to follow the crowd as they, as they cower in fear. Our spirit can be one of fearless progress. Amen. We can buck the system and obtain what God has given. So much of our Bible is a revelation of what God has made available to us. Independent of and in spite of failure and wrongdoing, he says, but I'll give you this and you can have this and I'll give you the right to, to, to act like this and I'll give you authority over this and this is who I say you are in Christ and this is what I've promised you and this is a new hope you have. This is what you can expect in the future. This is another promise I've made to you. And in the end, this is what you'll do. And this is what you'll have. Right? And, and we're supposed to see that. Well, look at that. I'm not just supposed to sit back and take life as it comes to me. I'm supposed to be on the, on the aggressive side, on the assertive side. And I'm saying, bless God, he's given me this land. I'm going in to get it. He's given me this promise. I'm, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take him up on his offer. Amen. And while others say, we can't. It's hard. It's work. It's this and it's that and the other. We say, I believe God. Yes. That he is able to perform what he promised. Amen. And he is able to do this work in me. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for working.